Well, as has been mentioned, this is my last sermon here. It's not my last Sunday here, but it's the last time I get to preach. And the most important thing we could do at this time is turn and look at Jesus. So, this is not about it being my last sermon here. This is actually about the fact that we get to tell stories about Jesus and live in to Jesus' word. Does that sound good? Let's do it. When Jesus uh, was walking on the earth and was among us, he was listening um, to a soundtrack that defined his life. There are several words that he lived by. We know that at, at his baptism, the heavens were opened and God said, Jesus, this is my beloved son. And Bart has said over and over that that is how God or Jesus lived with the heavens opened up and just knowing that his identity was beloved. And we live into that beloved identity too. But a core soundtrack for Jesus was the identity that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and it was for several things. So in Isaiah, in chapter 61, Jesus stood up and, and read this scroll in front of the, the assembled in the, in the temple. And Jesus said this, because the Lord has anointed me, because the Lord has anointed Jesus, God has sent me, Jesus, to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up those who are brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and to comfort those who mourn. So Jesus lived with this. This is how Jesus moved through the world. So we are in the midst of a sermon of Jesus's Sermon on the Mount, and these are the words that Jesus wanted to teach his followers to say, if you want to come to me, to learn from me, to live like me, this is the core message of what I want you to learn. So with that soundtrack, that he is there to comfort those who mourn, to bind up the broken heart of, to proclaim liberty, what's Jesus do at the sermon? He stands up and he looks out at the crowd and he blesses them. Right? Bart's been taking the last two weeks to look at this. But as Jesus looked out at the crowd, he saw at least three groups of people. And the blessings bless these groups of people. So I'm not going to take a look at an individual blessing this morning. I'm going to take a look at all of them in a, in a large scale, just to say, who is Jesus' blessing? The first of those beatitudes, those blessings, are for the receivers. The ones who are there, they know their neediness. As Bart said last week, they're well acquainted with their lack. We know that we need what God has to offer. That's the first group of people that Jesus blesses. The second group is the helpers. Those who have been filled with things that God has to share with others. Now, of course, these groups are not mutually exclusive, right? There are people who are receivers who are also helpers, of course. So they're Jesus gets up there and says, I know that you all are helping. You are workers in the vineyard, so to speak. You are ones who are laboring for this work of love. So he blesses them. And then there's a third group. And of course, if you're in the first group, you can also be in the second group, and you can also be in the third group. This is the toughest one. This is the group of the persecuted. Around the world... There are Christians who are being persecuted. There are people who are going out to serve Jesus' message in love. And they're persecuted for it. And Jesus sees those who are persecuted and blesses them. So I'm going to read these Beatitudes this morning in a way that hopefully isn't just for information, but it's for transformation. A prayer that I've had for all of us is that we would have real experiences of Jesus' love in our lives so that we would be transformed from the inside out. So I'm going to read these in a physical way, and I'm going to invite you to join me. So the first group was the receivers, right? For those, we're going to put our hands up to receive God's blessing for you. The second group is going to be the helpers, so I'm going to ask you to put your hands out for those like you're helping. And the third one's the toughest, right? The persecuted. I'm going to get on my knees to read those here. So do what is right for you. If it's to bow your head, if it's to get, take a knee, what works for you? So as I read these, I invite you to join me. 
Jesus got up and looked at the crowd. And in this way, he saw you and me. And he said, I'm going to proclaim good news to you and release to you, and I'm going to bless you. So, with your hands up, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And now for the helpers, you can put your hands out. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And lastly, for the persecuted. <clears throat> blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. To, to simply read the Sermon on the Mount, which I encourage all of us to do. Bart said you can listen to it on audio, you can take time to read it. It takes about 20 minutes to read the essence of Jesus' teaching. To read the Sermon on the Mount is to discover what it means to be Jesus' disciples. But to read it with faith, to read it with interaction, to read it as we just have with these postures, is actually to receive the power to be Jesus' disciples. So we're not just reading the word for information, but we're reading it for transformation. A lot of us knows what it says, and we can read it again to remind ourselves of what it says, but take a piece of the sermon and internalize it. And in the midst of chewing on it and meditating on it and steeping your heart in it, be transformed by it, not just informed. Seeing that this is... Uh, my last sermon here. It is kind of fun to think about what's happened while I've been here. And I would say a, a healthy goodbye, which is what I've experienced in this time, started with a healthy welcome. It was a healthy hello. And you know why? It's because this is a healthy church. This is a church that has reached out and met me in a place where I needed to be met. And it was from day one. Bart set a great healthy welcome. You know how he welcomed me? He said, David, we're so glad to have you here. And God will use you here for whatever God wants done here. But as soon as God calls you somewhere else, God will keep doing exactly what God wants done here at this church without you. God doesn't actually need you here. <laughs> and it's so true. It's so true, and we can believe it in our minds. We can believe, oh yeah, God doesn't actually need me here. But now we get to walk into that in faith and believe what we know to be true. You know, you guys are, are so gracious in this goodbye. So many of you have said something along the lines of, we're so excited for you, David, and your family, and we're sad for us. And the inverse of that is, I am so excited for what's ahead for me and our family, but I'm also sad for what's left behind here. Transitions involve loss. So now I get to walk into the faith that God doesn't need me here, but God has what's best in mind for each and every one of you who remain here. So there's a release in this time. So this healthy welcome of, David, God doesn't need you here, <laughs> is actually how we should hold each day. Uh, as you know, my father-in-law passed away uh, while I've been here. It was a year, a year and a half ago. And he was born with a congenital heart defect. He had um, tetralogy fallow, which means that at uh, his age, when he was born, most of the people who were born with that condition previous, their parents were just told, spend as much time with your baby as you can. 
because they're not going to make it. And when he was born, he was born just on the cutting edge of some brand new surgeries that were, they were trying out. So when he was 14, he had a, a, a cutting edge surgery um, that uh, allowed him to live a full life. But none of us ever knew that. That was going to be the story. The person who also had the surgery right next to my father-in-law, another 14-year-old, he didn't make it through the surgery. So when I met my father-in-law, I held him with this lightness that every day we had with Peter was a gift. And Gail, who's here, when Gail married Peter, she didn't know if you'd have him for a day or a lifetime. And we got to have him for 70 years. In the time of goodbye with Peter, though, there was such a rich health in the fact that every day we had with Peter was a gift. We didn't expect or take for granted the fact that Peter was going to live to 70. But because we got all those days, the goodbye had a rich healthiness in it. And that's how I feel about the time here. These actually haven't been my days to hold on to, but God opened the doors. God opened the doors each and every step of the way to be here. Joy mentioned it yesterday at the barbecue, which was so great. Thank you, Framptons. And it was so fun to see all of you who were able to be there. Uh, Joy mentioned that God called us here. This was not our idea. This was God's clear call saying, David called Bart. I called Bart. Bart and Linda and Joy and I spoke. And uh, it turned into, David, come and see what happens. And we did. And we showed up, not by our own design, but we showed up pregnant homeless and jobless. <laughs> that wasn't the plan, by the way. The plan was to show up with the remote software job that I had had for a few years at a startup. And, you know, God changed the plan. The startup was shrinking. You know, I wasn't the first to be let go, but I was, uh, you know, off the list. So Joy and I were in Seattle at the time, and I said, Joy, this isn't how we're supposed to go to Santa Barbara. <laughs> it's not going to work. And Joy said, David, God called us to go to Santa Barbara. God didn't call us is to go as long as we had a job and as long as we had a place to live, then we should go. No, it was the exact opposite. God said, go, and it wasn't because of these other things. So we looked in our bank account, and we realized we could spend two months in Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> And it was putting our, we were well acquainted with our own lack in this sense. It was putting ourselves in that position saying, well, God, you've called us, so we're going to make the most of these two months. And we'll see what happens. And each and every step of the way, God kept wanting us here. And so many times, you all have asked, you know, in a loving way, but, you know, we're young and Santa Barbara's a tough place to make it. And you all have asked, so how long are you guys going to be here? Not in a sense of like, hey, how long are you guys going to be here? But really in the sense of like, so how long do, is this going to work? And almost every time I'd say, do you want the real answer? The real answer is we are here as long as God has us here. And God has made it possible every step of the way. Those two months were made possible by God. But guess what? God kept making more months possible. God opened up a job for me here. And God opened up some amazing housing for us here that we could have never walked into by knocking on the doors ourselves. So God just kept opening doors. And we kept saying yes, and we kept praying, and God just kept saying, I have gifts for you. One of the delights about spending this much time with Bart has been God called me to this, and every single time, I've gotten to spend time with Bart, whether it's in a large group like this, you know, Bart's preaching, or it's in a smaller group, you know, the leadership team of the church, or a small group, or it's just the two of us, one-on-one. -on -one. The Holy Spirit has a gift for me every single time. And it's not something I count on. It's not something that I'm just like, all right, what's it going to be this time? It's just we're hanging out, and the Holy Spirit goes, David, here you go. Here's the gift for today. Here's the gift for this time. So I feel like I've spent the last seven plus years here just unwrapping gifts and unwrapping gifts and unwrapping gifts. And I haven't known where it's going to be going. 
It's been such an adventure. It's in ways, it's like I was sitting on a catapult at one end, and God was at the other end and stomped on this end and just launched us through the air. And I feel like I was in that position going, wow, where are we going? I don't know where it's going to land, but it has kept me on the edge of my seat the entire time. So these gifts that we keep unwrapping are gifts of the kingdom that God has for each and every one of us. So as Jesus stood up, and looked out on the crowd and blessed them, Jesus is doing the exact same for each and every one of us today. He sees you. He sees me. He sees where we are. He knows our need. And he blesses us into what he calls us into. We're continuing to follow the call. God's clearly called Joy and I forward into this new partnership with uh, Kavika, Uncle Kavika, up in the Redwoods, up in Santa Cruz. And it is going to be a gift. And we are so excited. And one thing that I wanted to make sure I mention is I think there has also been folks who have said, oh, David, you know, well, I'm so glad that you're going to be at this church, and when Bart retires, you'll be able to take over, and, you know, kind of grooming up the next leader at this church. I want to let you know that God isn't calling me to that. So, the senior pastor that God has in mind for you after Bart's retirement is the one that God is calling into that position. So I know that so many of you would think, oh, well, that's just kind of an obvious next step for you here, David. And that is a really sweet thought. But I wanted to let you all know that God has someone in mind that God is calling to that role. And it would be unfaithful for me to just slide into the next most obvious thing when really God is calling us into something else. But I do feel like I'm walking away from a dream team, <laughs> working not only with all of you, but specifically with the staff and the leadership of this church really has been a gift for me. And I've said it before, but the fingerprints of all of you all, of the leadership of Bart and Linda, will be on my ministry for the rest of my life. You guys have had such an influence on me. There's no way that I'll go forward from Summerland without Summerland coming with me. So I've had so many conversations with so many of you. Yesterday we were talking about uh, mercy and justice and blessed are the merciful. Well, to be full of mercy is to be someone who has received so much mercy for ourselves that then our cup has been filled up and it's running over. And then the mercy that runs out of us is actually the overflow of the mercy that we've been able to allow pour in to the deepest part of ourselves. So if you want to be merciful, allow yourself to be filled fully with the mercy of Jesus. It's these kind of conversations that I've had with you all that will continue on and to continue out into the good news. But I do want to take a moment to just highlight a few things. It's been fun in this season of reflection to think about um, what God's done for me in this time. This has definitely been a season of singing. Song of Solomon says, in one place, the season of singing has begun. That's so beautiful to think of this time in that way. I mean, Joy and I became parents during this time. I became a dad here, and over the years I gave sermons that were reflections on faith and fatherhood. As I grew into this identity of being a father, I learned more about what it's like for the one who Jesus called Father to pour into us as I'm pouring myself out into our kids. One of those first sermons I preached on faith and fatherhood was Miracle Overload. I was looking at our son Kavika after he was born, and I realized he's a miracle. Like, this is a miracle. And then to see him and to know that he was a miracle, I had to look at those and say, oh my gosh, well, if he's a miracle, that means, Rob, you're a miracle too. And Linda, you're a miracle too. And Jenny, you're a miracle too. And then I remember looking, I was crossing the street, and I was looking up at a crowded place with lots of cars and drivers and people, and I was just going, oh my gosh, Every single one of these people is a miracle. 
this is an overload. It was a complete miracle overload. And so living into that has formed me here. Also, there was a year of time here. I don't know that you would remember this, but there was uh, a year where I talked about uh, a rhyming New Year's resolution that I made. The rhyming New Year's resolutions during the teens were kind of easy because I just added an ing onto the word that I wanted to use. But Joy thought this one sounded a little wrong, so you got to listen closely. 2018 was the year of gratituding. Joy thought it sounded like something else. Gratituting. Joy. But it was gratituding. It was the year where I just said, I'm going to be thankful for at least one thing for one person and one thing for God every day this year. So it was just an intentionality that I made. I was going to say thank you to God for one thing and thank you to a person for one thing every day of the year. And to remind myself, because I'm kind of thick and slow sometimes, I decided I was going to wear something that said thank you in some language every day of the year. So I had a couple hats made and I had some shirts made and every day of the year I wore one of those things. And you know how many people noticed? Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't for anybody else. It was for me. And that was the important thing. And about halfway through the year, the biggest thing I learned was I set my goal too low. I mean, come on. Thank you to God for one thing a day. And thank you to one person for one thing a day. That's like kindergarten stuff. So halfway through the year in July, I went off the deep end. And I started thanking God for things that hadn't happened yet, which was really hard because I knew ahead there would be loss and there would be grief. There would be great things and exciting things as well, but then in the second half of that year, God took me into a journey of gratitude for things yet unknown. And that was where my character was formed in gratitude. So for all of us looking to grow in gratitude, I would say start with the gratitude that you can say thank you for and ask God to grow you into the gratitude that you can't yet say thank you for. And God will take you there. And that was transformational for me. I talked about this being a season of singing, and it has been. It's also been a season of grief in many ways. Um, we, I've lost two dear members of the family in just in the last year and a half, and that's been really hard. Spiritually, I would say over the course of this time, I've, I've hit a transition point. I'm now 42, so I'm over the hill. But over the hill, spiritually, oh, you all are shaking your hand like, oh, David, you're so young. Come on. <laughs> what, 40 is the new, I don't know, 30, 20, thank you, keep them coming, I'll take them. No, but spiritually, in the first half of life, there are things, in the second half of life, there are things, and I've taken on some new language about first half of life spirituality and second half of life spirituality. One of those bits of language is the first half of life is learning to acquire. It's learning how to grab onto what's new and what's exciting and what I haven't learned before. But then the second half of life is learning to let go. Bart told such an amazing story about when they were staying with the Winters and Dave Winter at that point had already been Westmont uh, president. At that point, he had already lost his sight. He was in his 80s. And Bart was sitting at his feet saying, what can I learn from you? So he asked a question. He said, Dave, what do you know now that you wished you knew at my age? I mean, Bart was about 60 at the time. And Dave said, no one told me there would be so much loss. And that's something that now as I'm starting to enter this season of second half of life living, I'm learning to let go. I'm learning to live into what it means to let go of things that have meant so much and to let go. So if I think about first half of life spirituality and second half of life spirituality, I'm leaning into the harder journey. And I have so many models of people who have leaned into this journey here at this church. You all are taking me further than I could go on my own into learning 
to live, and not just live, but thrive in the midst of loss. So that's one thing I wanted to say thank you for, to all of you, to help me learning to live and thrive in the midst of loss. Well, a healthy hello started with David, we don't need you here, and a healthy goodbye is taking time to acknowledge those who have been such a big part of this time. So I do want to take a moment to acknowledge um, some, of the, some of the crew here. I do want to say thank you to the staff. So I, I took a word for the folks here. And Kathleen, I'm going to start with you. Working with Kathleen's a dream, by the way. She has such an artistic gift. You all get to experience the gift that she has. But then to know her and know her presence, know how she is internalizing what it means to worship. She's just here to worship Jesus and to bring us along in that journey. The way she spends so much of her time thinking about what it's like to bring us closer to Jesus through worship is just an amazing gift that she has. And she's no drama. You know, some artists are like, oh, I didn't think, oh, I forgot all this stuff. Kathleen is an artist's artist. She's an artist, artist to the core and loves to have conversations about faith and art. But she is on it with the details. We never have to think, oh, did Kathleen remember this? So Kathleen, thank you for being the whole package. Artistic and amazing and also a complete team player and totally dependable. So for you, thank you for your artist, artistry and aesthetic. It's been a gift to work with you. Thank you for allowing me into the story of what it's meant for you to be here. And that goes also by extension to all the musicians. So one of Kathleen's gifts is to bring a team. She doesn't just do this by herself. She just goes out there and she says, oh, you sing? Come along to the party too. So to all of you who have been on her singing teams or for all of you who have been a part of the big choir that we've had here every once in a while, thank you for leading me in worship. So Marsha and Tom, Patty, thank you. Annika, wherever, there you are, Annika. Jenny, th thank you for your music. Rob, you are a gift to us. The way you bring this cello, you bring years and years and years of what it means to consider uh, not just covering other people's worship music, which is what so much of what we do, if you think about it, we, read, we, we sing worship songs that other people wrote. But one of Rob's emphases in life is to sing the worship songs out of our own community's voice. And he's dedicated a lot of his life to saying, what's the voice in your heart? What's the song in your heart? And connecting those and bringing those out in worship. And Rob, when you are a part of our worship here, you bring that. So thank you. Jenny wears many hats here. Jenny, I'd also like to thank you as our, our, our director of uh, ministry to our children and their families, which so much of the time have been our children and our family. Thank you for that. But for all the families who have been here, Jenny, you are a delight to work with, and you know how much we love you, and I know that you love us, and thank you for that. And the word I have for you, Jenny, is you have been nurturing. Our kids come into Sunday school, and they have someone who just nurtures them. So thank you, Jenny. And uh, this whole team has a backbone. There are people who, who serve and do, and that's people who would never want me to say their name, but Billy, Shelly, you guys crush it. I was, Joy and I were in a small group with Billy and Shelly the first couple years we were here, and you want to know who knows the most scripture memorized by heart of anyone on the staff? It's not me and Bart, it's Billy. If you wanna know something, Billy, I just blew your cover, sorry buddy. <laughs> if you wanna know something, where something is in the Bible, ask Billy. If you need someone to give you a verse for today, just say, Billy, I need something from scripture. Can you just give me something? Billy's got it written on his heart. Is that the good Baptist background in you, Billy? Is that what that is? <laughs> Billy's got it in his heart. And that's the way he serves our church. And Shelly always serving with food and love. That was one of the first things here was uh, the meals. Remember the meals? We'll bring those back. Right now they're on pause. But coming on a Saturday and helping prepare things for Billy and Shelly to take out to those who are hungry, that was one of my first impressions of our church. So Billy, Shelly, and the team of all those who have served the food here, 
Your word is serving. Thank you for your absolute dedication and service. Speaking of doers, Peter's in the back. Peter hasn't been up front in a long time because he is making it all happen on the video board. Peter gets things done. Peter is such a yes, I will, just point me in the right direction and I will go that way. In addition to being a, a visionary and someone who can help have conversations and strategy and brainstorm, he says, yeah, I'll do it. So I'm gonna go over here so I can see Peter. Peter, thank you for everything. And for Melinda with you and the team, including Michael who's been at the soundboard, thank you for your whole team. And then there's Bart and Linda. What do you say? I mean, these guys are incredible. And I have had so much fun with you both. It's not just like you're theologically informed. You're a lot of fun to be around. It's like, you know, once you're a young lifer, you're always a young lifer. These two are just overgrown young life leaders. And I feel like we've been in your youth group and it's great. And of course, if I were in high school and you were in your early 20s, I would have remembered all the like goofy, silly things you had said. I, I do remember a couple of them. One of my favorite ones was when Bart was talking about preaching and he was like, well, you know, I'm short, but people don't think of me as short. And you know, so what I do, I just, I look like a shrimp, but I preach like a whale. <laughs> <laughs> and you do, and thank you and it comes out of your soul. I, I bumped into a great quote that said, um, as the leader goes, so goes the organization. So for us as a part of this, we have gone where the leader goes, but as the soul of the leader goes, so goes the leader. And Bart and Linda, you lead with your souls, and we have gone with you there. So you've left us with so many nuggets, so many great questions to ponder. Of course, one of them is, what does it look like not only to believe in Jesus, to believe, but to believe like Jesus? What's it look like for our lives to believe like Jesus believed? And you've left us with other questions like, what would your life look like? How would Jesus live your life if Jesus had your life to live? If Jesus isn't saying, oh, you know, well, I'm calling George, I'm calling you to be, you know, you know, St. Francis. He's not saying that. He's saying, oh, Tom, John, Diana, Gail, how would your life look like if Jesus had your life to live? Your friends, your family, your job, your neighbors, what would it look like for Jesus to live that life and live into that version of it? And then another one that I've already mentioned is um, Bart has invited us to come to Jesus, to learn from Jesus so we could live and love like Jesus. And that's the bottom line. So this is the team spirit that we've gotten to live with. Thank you. But of course, then there's all of you. You are all a part of the team. When I first showed up, Jim Dahl, who's been great, he said, David, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm just here to be mentored by Bart. And Jim looked at me and said, well, we're all here to be mentored by Bart. <laughs> so for all of you who have gotten to be around us and formed in this way, I wanted to say thank you. So a healthy church has a healthy hello and a healthy goodbye. And I wanted to bless you with a goodbye. I wanted to bless you in the way that Jesus ends his Sermon on the Mount. He opens with the blessings, and then at the end, Jesus says, build your kingdom on the rock. Build your, or sorry, build your house on the rock. Nourish in my kingdom. So earlier he says, go out and be salt and be light. Don't just hear my words, but do them internalize them, be transformed by them, and live into them. And I want to see you all nourished by these words, and I want to see you flourish in life. So, looking to the future, being thankful to the future, not only to what we anticipate with excitement, but what we're afraid of, knowing there will be loss. Look to the future with gratitude, 
Look to it knowing that there is nourishment in it. And I challenge you to give something up. Something that you're holding on to that's preventing you from following God's call deeper into the nourishment that God has ahead for you. God's calling each and every one of us. And it's not always to move somewhere, to make a big change, but God has a call for something for you this week. God's saying, hey, Kay, Keith, do something. Do this this week. Whatever it is for you this week, say, God, call me towards it and let me do it. So I'm going to bless you with the words that Jesus was blessed with. These are from the sacred text that Jesus looked to and called the Law and the Prophets. It was the blessing that had been passed down from Aaron, one of the priests, all the way through the generations. And it said, the Lord bless you, and the Lord keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and to be gracious to you. The Lord, the Lord turn his face or his countenance towards you, and to give you peace. Amen. There's one other benediction I wanted to read to you all, and I'm going to invite you to stand for it, and I'm actually going to come to the middle. You, can, you guys don't get to see each other the way I get to see you. I get to look at your faces, and you look at the back of each other's heads. So this way, you get to look at each other and see what it's like to be in the community of those who are seeking Jesus' face. And now receive this blessing from Paul 
It's straight from his words in Ephesians. And now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's sing that again.